This episode of the Profit Express is brought to you by Corbett Public Relations, promoting and protecting businesses and brands for over 30 years. You can please visit my friends at CorbettPR.com. That's C-O-R-B-E-T-T-P-R.com, CorbettPR.com. Well, hello and welcome to the Profit Express. I am Tim Healy and I'm inviting you to join me each and every week so together we can win the battle for business. So as always, thanks for sharing some of your time with me today. You can follow me in the show on Instagram at The Profit Express, uh, on Twitter at Profit underscore Express, and of course on Facebook at The Profit Express page to get latest updates and the newest episodes. Now... Today's guest is somebody who can literally run a master class in hustle, creativity, sales, marketing. I've been super excited to have him on. But despite that, it's really the, the focus of today's conversation with today's guest is really when he was at the highest moment in his life, having sold his business for more money than he could ever have dreamed of. So while I was... He's at his highest. He also coincided with that being one of the lowest points in his life. So if you are a business owner and you've been toiling, creating a successful business of your own for years, my guest journey is going to be a great one to help you understand what is the real meaning, not just in business, but in life as well and striking that balance. And uh, as many of you are, you're also getting ready to sell those valuable businesses you built for so long, which is certainly going to represent a big sea change in your life. So as today's guest, again, I said it, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, he is Brandon Steiner. I'm sure you know the name. And not only did he create a successful business that he ended up selling, but he also, on the way, created also an industry, the sports memorabilia industry. And now he's a part of the Steiner Agency and the Collectible Exchange. And it's a great uh, honor to have him back on the show. Brandon, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. All is good. No complaints. Got the weather. <laughs> and hopefully everybody out there is safe. And, uh, you know, we're on our way to something that's, you know, a lot better this next four or five months than what we've had over the last year. So I'm, I'm excited about, you know, the opportunity, more change coming, more change. Sure. I've seen more change than well, I've the only, you know, the only thing you know about change is that you're not getting any from a vending machine, that's for sure. But, you know, we're getting, <laughs> getting a lot of change, and there's a lot of new things about to happen uh, over these next six or eight months. And uh, if you keep on your toes, you'll be able to take advantage of it. Well, you bring up a great point because as horrible as 2020 was for a lot of reasons, it was a great learning opportunity for so many of us, especially those in business, if, if you took advantage of it. Yeah. And like you said, well, you listen, can't fall off the floor, you know, it's like, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, is that a, Ste is that a Steinerism? Respects, what? Is that a Steinerism? You can't fall off the floor? You can't fall off the floor, man. Like it's, you know, these last eight, 10 months. I mean, you definitely had time to rethink, reset, refire, re see mm -hmm. who your real friends are, get a gauge on your health. I mean, there's a lot of boxes you could check if you actually were awake. And just get in the moment of what's really going on. There's some good learning lessons. And and I think, you know, when you get, it sounds kind of trite about when you get kind of those learning lessons about realizing where you've been, who you spend time with, who you really care about, who cares about you. you right. Know, you put all that stuff together and you actually get honest about it all. It really can give you the firepower to move forward. It really can give you the path. Because I always say you got to settle up your past in order to get a future score that you want. And I think that, to me, the last year has given me that and so much more. But besides the ability to focus, you know, it's like mm -hmm. I have so much less distraction. Nobody's stopping over. I don't have to go meet with people. You know, everybody's like, let's meet. Like, let's not. Let's just do it soon. <laughs> I don't have to drive and go to the park and then wait for you because you're on an extended call. Right. You know, the, Zoom, the Zoom thing has made everything really efficient cut down oh. on a lot of travel it's enabled me to really lock in and focus and be better at what i'm doing uh because of it yeah no listen you, you're you're absolutely right and it has to have 
you know, if you know what you're doing, it has to have been a, a learning experience for you. And there's a lot more efficiencies. Like you said, I did 30,000 miles in 2019. Last year, I did like 7,000. It's a beautiful thing. You know, you're saving so much time and energy. It allows you to focus on what's real. Now, look, b before we jump into this, I, I just had to share this with you. You were on the show a number of years ago. And like I said, you could write a master class on hustle. And you know your book, You Gotta Have Balls. And you, you were kind enough to give me, if you could see here on screen, that you gotta have balls ball, right? Just to let you know, it's, it's been on my desk ever since. And I, I, I look at it every day and it reminds me, gotta keep hustling. So I, so I, I want to thank you for that. Well, with the ball, with, you know, you gotta have balls. That was my second book. And yeah, you're an entrepreneur and a salesperson. It's a great book. You read the book and you, first thing you say to yourself is, that guy's not that smart. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's nobody who's going to be more successful than me with as little talent as I have. I'm the highest success level ratio to talent you're ever going to meet. But, you know, you got to have balls is my mother's favorite line. And, and right. the, you got to have balls is about being more than just hustle. It's about smartsmanship, which is hustle, but also being diligent, thinking about right. what you're talking about grinding, being relentless, you know, being consistent and, and not being afraid. You know, my mother's big thing about having balls is about if not you, then who? Don't be afraid. Don't play small. Yeah. You know, don't you, you, stop at success. You know, don't just because you had a little success. Don't get full of yourself. Really? Right. Right. There's a lot more success to be had behind that. Don't don't get crazy. And that's you, just a you, way of keeping yourself grounded because a lot of times success is a huge deterrent for more success. And I hate when I see people that are successful that could be ultimately extraordinary, but they just stop at success. It really bothers me. Well, I, I think if, if they if they stop at that first level of success, you know, did, did they ever really have a long game plan to begin with? And they probably not if, if they get, you know, sidetracked by that initial success. But who does? Uh, Who's got a long term game plan? Really? I mean, especially younger people. I mean, they're worried about today, what time they got to be at work, what time they can leave, what time is happy hour. And if they got a girl, they got a call to get a date. I right. mean, who, you know, and, and this is like such an important element of really true growth is about the playing long and not playing small. And I, that's what kills me. I see so many talented young people. Uh, they're just amazing. And they're, they're smarter than I ever was and ever going to be. But they play small and they can't think big picture long term. It drives me crazy. So, so that, that frustrates you just, you, you say, with young folks, but also with athletes as well? Do you, do yeah. you see that? Yeah. Yes. And what's crazy is, is that the kids are talented. Unlike when I was coming out of school, most of us, you know, we thought we were all smart. <laughs> we always thought we were a little smarter than we were. But these kids are actually smarter than they think they are. They are incredibly efficient in getting things done. But, but you can't play the long game and shortcut it. There is no app. Right, right. Big. There is no app for heart. There's no app for follow up. There's no app for doing the right thing, even though it doesn't show up on your bottom line. There is no yeah. app for you know, a level of kindness and digging your well before you're thirsty with clients and relationships. We were just talking about it on a call the other day about touches. And, you know, and, and John Gray from Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, he talks a lot about touches. Like if you want to have a better relationship with your wife, you know, don't buy her a dozen roses buy her one rose 12 times or tell her yeah, that her shoes yeah. look nice. Notice that she just got a manicure. Those are all touches. And if you want to have a great marriage, you got to have those touches. Or if you want to have sex, by the way, you got to have those touches. But more it helps. Importantly, yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, you're, 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 you have this great wife. You have this great marriage. You want to have a great relationship. It's the same thing in business. If you want to have a great relationship, you got to have the touches. You got to send a little note. You got to call up and ask them how things are without just always asking for a sale. You know, you got to know what they are doing with their family, what's going on with them. You got to know what's keeping them up at night, what's getting them excited in the morning. And those are touches. And you got to, mm -hmm. you know, you got to mm -hmm. keep on that if you want to have a long standing, play the long game. Well, it's it's not it's it's not just the big splash in the relationship. It's the consistency. Yes. It, you know, and that, that's that's the hard game. You know, it, it being yeah. consistent day in, day out. That's what separates a lot of people who were, you know, flash in the pan versus long term success. So what, what I'd like to get to, because this is a, a big part of the message I want to share today. I'm here. For um, you. <laughs> there's a lot we could share, certainly. But you talk about 
one of the happiest, highest points of your life when you sold Steiner Sports for more money than you ever dreamed of, you know, being a kid from Brooklyn. And so while that was the highest point, and you, and you toiled for years and years building that up, it was also one of the lower points for you. Take us back to that, and why, why that dichotomy? I mean, first of all, anytime you sell something you put your heart and soul into, is always a very emotional moment. Right. And a moment of questioning, like, why are you doing this? And are you sure you don't want to do this on the same on the same level? Which, obviously, if you own something and build something and then don't own it anymore, you're only kidding yourself if you don't think things are going to change. And, and generally, they don't end well, by the way. <laughs> anytime, you, anytime you do anything where the cornerstone of it is for money, which I'm not going to lie, like, I didn't need the money when I sold the company, but I definitely wanted the money because it would put me independently wealthy. Okay. So I, so I did I did it for the money. Okay. Uh, but I also did it because it was an opportunity to get my company a lot bigger, give me the support and all the other bull crap that, you know, it's appropriate to say. But at the end of the day, what I realized, it was a sad day because I was high-fiving with my wife on Madison Avenue. We had this huge check <laughs> and there was more checks coming. And I realized, I'm like, I don't know where the hell I've been for the last 10 years. Other than being a master of business and hustle and, and yeah. growing the industry. But I knew that I wasn't a husband. I knew I wasn't that great a friend. Like my friends would call me up. They're like, want to get together tomorrow? I'm like, um, how's never? It's never good. And I, I was just, I wasn't even paying attention. I was like the worst friend. I was just so wrapped up in winning. You, you, you actually you actually had those thoughts when, when a friend would call. It's like, yeah, I just don't have time for you. Forget it. Well, you call me a never, yeah. right? Oh, there's no question. I had that thought. Really? Everybody, unless you help me make money. Or help me grow my business. I had no use for you. I was so singular focused. And I think you got to get singular focused. Like, you talk to a major league baseball player, a basketball player, I mean, they're very singular focused about their health, what they're eating, working out, traveling with the team, mm -hmm. what's the part of the game they got to work on. It's no difference in business. It's no difference when you get somebody who's in medical school and then they become an intern. I mean, you can't talk to these people, you know, the first five, 10 years out of medical school. You're so committed to being this best doctor you could be. I was committed to being the best business person I could be. I just couldn't get the other stuff, the other funnels going. I couldn't get my mind on a swivel at all. I, I couldn't get my, I, I was definitely about a stone throw away from having a heart attack. I didn't even know what faith meant. Like thinking about having faith, I didn't even know what it was. Well, that, that's a, interesting because in, in, in your book, Living on Purpose, you, you, talk, you talk about faith and it was that, that rather interesting conversation that Yankee great Mariano Rivera had with you. Didn't he kind of get those wheels spinning with you regarding faith? There's no question. I think, you know, I think what happens when you grow up and you're grinding and if you start off, you know, I, I was very poor when I grew up. I think, you know, you think it's all about the hustle, but it, it really isn't. It's all about, you know, your commitment to doing the best you can and knowing that mm. it's going to work out. I think a lot of people missing faith in their recipe to success, like believing that there is light even though when it's dark. Like even when during this whole virus, as down as sometimes I would get, I always mm -hmm. have faith that there will be light and that, that this thing will work out. And you have to work towards that light. Otherwise, you really can get caught up in the dark. And I feel that way. That's kind of how it was in 2000. Like I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Like, well, I'm just doing it, just churning and burning and making money. And I, I don't know. Like, And then the faith was really interesting because – I had the argument with Mariano a whole bunch of times that I should believe in a higher power. And really, you know, it's faith is something that you believe in that you can't see. So it's hard for some yeah. people that if you can't actually pictureize it or put it on paper, or, you know, then people don't want any part of it. And I'm not, I'm not getting religious on you. I'm just getting, you know, as far as more spiritual, sure. Where, sure. you know, you have to believe there's a higher power and that when you do good, you're going to get back good. So, you know, what I decided to do, the smartest thing was, you know, it's funny, like how you put different twists on it, but I just made it into a game. I was like, listen, if I killed myself to be a really good business person, now I'm going to kill myself to be a better spouse, better friend. I'm going to kill myself to be a better health nut. And what I did is I decided to do a pod. And this is when I was doing, nobody was doing pods, pods and blogs. Like, you know, this is like 15 years ago. 20 years ago. It was ahead of the curve, yeah. Since yeah. I had a relatively bigger name as a sports person, I started interviewing some of the biggest names. I go into Barnes & Noble and say, give me the number one book <laughs> in health. 
give me the number one book on marriage. Give me the number one book on parenting. And I would just start calling up the authors and say, look, I do this sports blog. I think this would be a great topic to bring to my sports following. And, you know, most of them didn't have a sports following. They were completely in the opposite. Right. And yeah, yeah. To read it, and I had a learning disability. So re, me reading a book is kind of like, uh, you know, going, going to the dentist. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not a big reader, even though I've written three books. But, and I've written 2,500 blogs. You know, I'm, I'm half illiterate, but I don't know. Somehow I did that. But what's crazy <laughs> is, is that I would get some of the biggest authors to come on my pod or visit me. I'd take them to Yankee games, stay at my house. I get two days of a John Gray two days of a Ken Blanchard, like really everything there is about leadership, management, health, fitness, uh, all that stuff, spiritual content. And that's really what drove me to write the last book was it's just, it's really not what I know. It's what I learned and what I did. Cause I hate when mentors and teachers tell you what to do. I'd rather sh you show me what to do. Right, so in this right, book, right. I show you what I did. It's a lot easier for you to learn off of my mistakes. Yep. You know what I mean? Like nobody yeah. wants to admit that they're screwed up. They made a mistake. But that Brandon Stein, yeah, he, you know, he learned how to be a better dad. You know, I could do that too. And that's a better way to, to learn. Like in my coaches club that I have at Kill Williams, like it's a big show you what to do. Let me show you how I learned off of my mistake and what I did to fix it. And right. it's a much easier way to learn that way. Uh, you know, so your ego doesn't get in the way. So, you know, it was a really tough period of time for me because I was feeling really guilty about making so much money. Yeah. I don't really understand why me versus so many other people that work hard. There's so many people that work hard that don't necessarily have the financial success. And then what I realized is that, so what? Financial yeah. success is just a small little part of it all. And it's kind of overrated. And what's successful is that, you know, when you're in meaningful relationships, that you have a, a family that, you know, that loves each other and, and that you're healthy. You're not at the doctor every other day. Like that is much more importance of success than it is how much your paycheck is at the end of the year. Now, let me ask you. So, and it was your, your previous book, Living on Purpose, right? When, when you had written that book and you, there it is, Living on I'm Purpose. I'm signing some today that right here. That's why. Awesome. Um, was it hard for you? Because there was a certain admission of where you had fallen short on the, the husband side, on the father side. That's, you know, you, you put it out there. Was that tough for you? Oh, yeah, it was misery. But, you know, what, what I learned is when I did You Gotta Have Balls, which is a big success, that the second book of how I built Steiner and how you could build your brand. It was a great brand building book. I read every comment. I'm one of these, you know, OCD. I read every comment, feedback. I read every oh, comment God. on Facebook. You know, I want to I take it all in. So I'm reading these feedback on the balls. And I think it was like 300 comments on the book and like right. two negative ones. <laughs> you know, one was just a hater that I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But one was like, how convenient it was for you, Steiner. Everything fell into place. Did nothing bad happen to you? Did you have any shortcomings? Because this book is too good to be true. And, you know, and, and, and the Balls book was true. But it, what he said was true also, that I hadn't really been transparent with the shortcomings. And with the problems and the mistakes, because there's no way you get to a high level of success without a high level of failures. I don't yeah. care what anybody says. Nobody really likes talking about them. Otherwise, I go to colleges and speak. They immediately go, well, where are your biggest mistakes? Where did you screw up? Yeah. So yeah. it kind of drove me to write this book. You know, it was like my family wasn't too happy about it because I brought in a lot of examples of, you know, some missteps with parenting. I was a, I'm a good dad. I just wasn't a great dad. Like growing up, I said, one day I'm going to be a great dad because I didn't have a dad. Yeah. Here I am in the middle of the whole thing, and I'm a mediocre dad. If you ask my kids to rate me, I don't think they would give me a one or a two on a scale of one to ten. But maybe they would have sent them a six. I'm like, God, six? I'm like, I was always thinking I'd be a nine or a ten. And just because I made a lot of money didn't get me a nine or a ten. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if it came to making a lot of money, giving them a really nice house, good, getting good vacations, I would have got a ten. But sure. that didn't get me a ten. Wow, you know, you, that doesn't work. So, I thought the book was extreme. I, listen, if you read this book and do nothing else, just read the chapter on parenting. It's money. It's gold. It's a simplistic way of me giving you the most advice on how to parent. You know what? That I can within twenty pages. And by the way, none of it my advice. All from therapists. Great parenting that I've seen. I compiled it all together. So it's very proud listen, of that. Listen, and and I have the book here too, just to show you. 
And as I was reading, I wasn't sure, Brandon, I was not sure if I was going to mention this on today's show. But you mentioned parenting. And you even questioned, I think in the book somewhere, you said you weren't sure if you would include this chapter for the reasons you just mentioned. But as I was reading it, I, you know, you don't know me to the extent that, you know, I am, you know, a control kind of guy, you know, uh, OCD, right? And I got lots of rules. And I read your part where I said, hey, listen, you know what? It's, it doesn't make sense to have 100 rules. Have those one or two rules that really make sense. And I, I'm telling you, you, you spoke to me on that because as somebody yeah. who lives in a control kind of way. If you ask, that, yeah. If you ask my kids what's your dad's rules, they would immediately go, dad only had three rules. And I love the Bob Knight rule. I said, Bob, you must have mm. a lot of rules. You know, Coach Bob Knight, one of the legendary, the general. I said, yeah. you had a lot of rules. He goes, no, Brand, I had one rule. I said, all the teams, everything, one rule? He goes, right. One rule. And you know what his one rule was? Don't do anything that's going to piss me off. <laughs> and my three rules with the kids were, you know, one, you got to be a good person. You know, a good friend. Sure. Be generous. Be humble. You know, make your friends. Be a good friend. Be a good right. friend. Right. And you got to be a good family member. You got to be a good brother, sister, or son mm -hmm. or daughter. Right. And you got to do you. You got to do well in school. You got to do the best you can. You don't have to be the best. You have to do your best. You don't have to be the smartest in the school. You just have to be. If you come home and say this is the best that I could do, I'm good. I'm not caught up in what you're wearing, what you're eating, your room's dirty. You want to go to bed at midnight, be tired the next day, knock yourself out. I mean, well, I'm not yeah, didn't, didn't you talk about your son who went through the stage of wearing nothing but red for a couple of years? <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. Red, everything. Red sweatpants, <laughs> socks, turtle. That would drive me crazy. Yeah. Stay. I loved it. I'm like Crosby. <laughs> I saw a store today that had a bunch of red stuff. Let's go get it. Let's go find some new red stuff. And only red sweatpants, too. Wouldn't wear any regular <laughs> pants. You know, my daughter would only eat pasta with a little bit of butter. You know, would ne never, I mean, impossible. I, 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 whatever you want. You want to starve. You want to eat. You know what? No problem. I'm not going to get caught up in this because, you know, people go through phases. I tell people all the time, like, you got to be patient. You know, you got to lead with empathy. You got to lead with patience. And empathy is about understanding what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And when they're going through a phase, all you can do is be in that moment with them and be understanding. Right. So, you know, it's like when you were a kid, you were crawling. You kept getting up trying to walk. Your parents would say, you know, he's not a walker. I'm giving up on him. He's no good. <laughs> he's not going to walk. And it's the same thing with your kids. Like, I knew at some point my kid was not going to wear red. But, you know, what's, who cares? What's the difference? Right, right. So, um, you know, it's like you got to be careful not to get into these all these little micro arguments with your kids about nothing and making sure you stay, you know, stay what's important because your voice as they get older will get to be thinner and thinner. So I wanted yeah. to make sure that when they were younger, my voice was very well heard on the things that were, I thought were the most important. Listen, hey, just 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 for me, it had an impact. You wrote it well. You weren't like pontificating. You were just sharing some real lessons of, yeah. of what's worked for you. Uh, yeah, I liked it. That was that was a great chapter. That, that, there's one other thing that and figure it out is another one of my big things with my kids. I'm like, don't come to me and start asking me to solve all your problems. Figure it out. <laughs> you know, my kid comes to my room one day. He's like, Dad, Mom left early. She wants you to give her a ride. Give me a ride to school. I'm like, what? You woke me up so I could drive you to school. <laughs> Do I look like a limousine driver? Am I like a cab driver? Are you out of your mind? He's like, Dad, I'm nine. Like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, well, you go on these play dates, call one of your friend's mothers, Connor, into driving you. Or take those two feet, those two beautiful long legs that God gave you and walk. He said, well, that's three miles. I said, oh, three miles. Leave now. <laughs> or, or come to me with a value proposition. What are you going to do for me? I'm, I'm busting my ass all day uh, at work. Maybe, right. come, maybe come into my office and help me in my warehouse for a couple hours. Dad, I help you. Listen, you give me a ride to work. I'll help you in the warehouse for a couple hours. You know, we can help each other a little bit. I'm I little love it. Right now, I need a ride. I tell you, my kid left the room perplexed. He was just like trying to figure it out. But, you know, I was like, listen, at the end of the day, you're not always going to have somebody to give you a ride. So figure it out. Because yeah. people that really make it in this world, I think, start with people that want to figure things out. The most valuable employees to me are the ones that figure it out. They're not having somebody else figure it out and then just doing what they tell them. They're people that want to figure it out. And, it's the, and part of it's diligence and thinking it through 
and being accountable and responsible for what you got to do. And still a lot of grownups that still can't get that message. But think about how accountable you are and think about whether you are somebody who likes to figure things out. You'd be a lot happier if you are. Well, and listen, you, you taught them that lesson at nine when a lot of people haven't been taught that lesson in there in their twenties or thirties, you know, figure it out, you know, be resourceful, be creative, come to me with a value proposition. You teach him how to negotiate at a young age. I love There's it. No question. I mean, hey, listen, it's a doggy dog world out there. Don't, 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 don't lean on me every, every time you get a little bump in the road. Right. Right. <laughs> now it, in, you talk about, and I, I haven't heard it put this way. In, in, in all the, the reading and books I've, I've done, you talk about renegotiating relationships in life. And is, listen, to, to get where you were in life, obviously you had tons of relationships, business, et cetera. What do you mean by renegotiating relationships? Well, I think that, you know, first of all, you have to value relationships. You, you have to, I mean, relationships are, are they're everything. When you die, a big right. part of your of your, a big part of who you are and your success will be measured by the, the the amount of quality relationships you have. You know, I mean, I went to my father's funeral. We we, we only had seven people there, and the three of us it was me and my two brothers. And my mother were four, and the rabbi was five, and his sister was six. So you can do the math. You know, wow. at the end of the day, so you know that always hits home for me. But you know, when you're in a relationship that has gone off the tracks. Um, what I see happening too often is that relationships, instead of end, they get stopped because something happened. And that's mm -hmm. a shame. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put time and energy into getting to know somebody and having a, you know, a value add back and forth. And then something happens and the relationship stops instead of it ending. And I get into relationship renegotiation, which means before you blow up the relationship, sit down and get to know the person again. Because usually circumstances change with everybody. And right. as the circumstances change, you then can come up with a, hey, here's what you can expect from me. You know, if you just had a young baby or you, if you have three kids and you first came to work for me, you were single. The circumstances changed. You know, me yeah. calling you on a weekend, me calling you right after dinner when you're trying to put those kids to sleep. Where I used to, when you were single, call you at seven, eight o'clock to call you before you go out for the night. So to speak. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, things change yeah, yeah. in people's lives. And I think as a boss and as a manager, you have to re renegotiate your relationship with your, if, if no one else, even your own employees, because as their lives change, you need to alter your communication relationship with that person and make it better for them so they can continue on growing uh, with your with you and then growing with the, you know a new wife, a new kid, uh, a commute that they now have, you know, whatever it right. is. And those are all relationship negotiations, thinking that everything's going to stay the same and thinking that everything's going to keep going the way it's been going happens every now and then, but generally not. So learning sure. how to renegotiate your relationship means, you know, taking the time to get to know somebody again and sharing of information. And then after that, say, hey, this is what you can now expect from me. You can't expect anymore where you call me at seven, eight o'clock at night and having a, a real conversation about what happened for the day because that's not going to work for me. So it's it's really finding out how how that person has evolved with us personally, professionally, and then not you know just letting the the, the, the relationship wither away and die, but saying hey, yeah. what what can we do to keep it going to to still or you know, not spiraling back to the way things used to be. A lot of people they'll have a confrontation, they'll have a problem, and right. they spiral back to where things always were, and then you find yourself in a horrible relationship for ten years with both of you not happy. So that's yeah. why you have to share the information and, and reset. And change the change your roles. Re renegotiating the relationship. Yeah. Now, and today's guest is Brandon Steiner, uh, who's written the book literally on hustle, marketing, creativity. And today it's talking about what can be some of your highest moments of success can also bring with you some great challenges. And it's about seeing the whole picture. And that's really part of the reason I want to have you on today. I mean, there's so many aspects to your story, Brandon, but you know, realizing that it's certainly more than just success in business and dollars. Um, we talk about relationships and, you know, you know, as well as anybody, how important they are in business. And one story <laughs> that I, I, I love that I love for you to share when you were just getting started, it was a pivotal relationship. Otis Anderson, MVP, Super Bowl winning Giants. 
And there was a little, little story about you and him on a plane ride. What was that about? Well, I was getting into the athlete marketing business and things were starting to pop. And, you know, it sounds like a really exciting time, but it was difficult on the cash flow because the appearances were starting to lead up. And the companies I was doing business with, it takes a while to get paid. Yeah. So what's crazy is, is Edward Sanderson just won the MVP and we're going on a trip to Washington. And it was really quickly. A lot of things were happening and I was booking him and, um, we get on, we go get on the plane. We're doing a speaking engagement and I got the only two seats that were left on the plane and they were in coach and we got in the plane and he's like, where are we going? We just passed first class. And it's like, <laughs> well, we can get first class. Like there was only two coach tickets left. He's like, but Brandon, I, I just won the MVP. I'm an athlete. We fly first class. We're bigger. We're taller. It's not appropriate. And I was like, well, what do you want me to do? And then he, he won't get on the plane. He then gets on the mic on the loudspeaker. He says, hey, Zodi Sanderson, I just want to ask you all a question. I'm standing right there. I'm like, this is unbelievably embarrassed. <laughs> Should I get on this plane? I'm Otis Sanderson. You know, I just won the MVP. I played for the New York Giants. You think I should get on this plane? You think it's a right that here's my manager and we have these <laughs> tickets all the way in the back of the plane? Do you think it's right? Because I think I'm not going to get on this plane. I think I'm just going to. I mean, I'm, not, I'm just telling you, like, the person's ready to close the door. Oh we my God! Gonna, I mean, and here I am. Like, I needed that commission. I'm not even gonna. I mean, I need. Oh that. yeah. And I mean, it was very humiliating. But you know, it's funny. Like when, when we got back from the trip, and I, I was pissed because you just was killing me about these tickets. And you know, as a kid, I never even flew first class, so it wasn't a big deal to me. But and this is the most important lesson: is just because you feel something doesn't necessarily always mean it's true. And just because your perspective is one thing doesn't mean that's the correct and only perspective. People have different views. And, yeah. you know, when you're a professional athlete, you fly first class. And Otis said, look, Brandon, if you're going to get in this game, I remember we were in the parking lot and I was going to drive him home after the appearance. And he's like, Brandon, if you're going to get in the athlete appearance business, you, we fly first class. Athletes, you know, you get car services, not your Ford to pick me up and drive me <laughs> home right now. And, and also we get paid right away. You got to have the money to lay out for the players. If you lay the money out, if we go do an appearance, we're not sure how we're going to get paid. You may think you're an honest person and everything, but we're dealing with a lot of people. We don't want to have money owed to us. So you got to pay us up front. we got to fly first class. These are things that you, as a manager, have to negotiate. So as painful as it was, it was a great learning lesson because from that day forward, I remember going to the bank and getting a bigger loan, paying the players up front, which definitely right. helped me a lot with my relationship with a lot of the players, getting a car service. And just charging the company. I don't want to say, well, waste three hundred dollars. I could pick it up myself. But that's not <laughs> how it gets done. So uh, you know, you you know, I think there's you know, there are just bumps in the road where, you know, they're great learning lessons and that that was a good one actually. And uh Otis was my only client at the time, so he took the time to, you know, kind of school me and beat me up a little bit. Thank God he got on the plane, so that would have been embarrassing. But it worked out. <laughs> Wow, could you imagine if it happened today, everybody would have been taking a video of it. It would have gone viral, right? Think about that. Oh, there's My. no question. And Otis loved, I mean, he was a fun guy. And, you know, we, we ended up getting to know the whole air. We, the whole plane ended up being a boost as well. We got taking <laughs> business cards and everything else. But, you know, you know, when you deal with, you know, when you deal with uh, high level people, you know, you got to be prepared for, some of the quirkiness and some of the right. curveballs and uh sure and that, you know circumstances sometimes uh are that you're not used to but it's really important you stay you know i was lucky enough with otis you know read me the riot act a lot of players would have just not gone on the plane or not want to do another appearance with me yeah he actually yeah he, he took the time otherwise he could have just uh, ghosted you and that that could have been it yeah wow now w one thing that i'd be very interested to have you talk a little bit about is I, I in, in, in reading your books and following you, I see you as being a very creative individual and all the ideas you've come up for memorabilia over the years. And you talk about you being a big fan of daydreaming. How, how have you harnessed that, that skill, that, that time of daydreaming over your career? I mean, with difficulty, but it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's certainly uh, to be creative and be able to lose, you know, step outside yourself and kind of lose yourself is a great 
thing, but then sometimes it could be uh, annoying for employees or for a, a wife or kids when all of a sudden they're having a conversation, you're on another planet. But <laughs> I, I enjoy the creativity part of it. I got that from when I was a kid, you know, because it was just a way of kind of getting away from the reality. But I think that everything great that happens starts with dreaming. I think dreaming is really the, uh, the initiator to get you to purpose. And, and mm. I think sometimes people want to have purpose. And then I think when you dream, you know, there's nothing like having purpose when you dream and it leads you to purpose um, and commitment too. You know I mean? You dream something out. I always try to dream something out and I like to play it out. And then I kind of work backwards as far as executing it. And I think dreaming big is a really, really inexpensive way to do, you know, product development. You know, it's just you could go all over the place if you have the ability to do that. And I think that's been, I think one of my keys to success is that I don't only dream, I dream big. I mean, I've dreamt so many different things that are just so absurd. I don't know if I can even mention most of them even on this platform, but it's the same. But I'm like, hey, you never know. Like once in a while, and I'm talking about daydreaming, outright daydreaming, you know, sure. when I work out in the morning and like, Sometimes the dreams are so good, I'll, I'll actually do a replay on them. I'll actually replay it, alter a couple lines. And then I'm like, I like it that much. So I got to put this in play. I got to figure out how to make this happen. This is just too good a dream. It'd be amazing if it can happen. I'm living, I'm living out a dream right now. You know, this, this Talk about it. This new platform can that you? I'm creating. You know, I was dreaming that you know, I, was just, I, I was still at my old company and I was just dreaming that there's got to be a better way to do what I'm doing. And I, I just dreamt this whole collectible exchange that, that I now yeah. have in the yeah. new company called Athlete Direct, which is a, a site for players to sell direct to consumer. I'm like, people want to go to the players and get the stuff directly. That's the highest level of collecting. You go to a player and you get something from them directly. There's nothing like it when a player comes to my office and gives me like Mark Messier came to my office when they gave me the 611 stick. Mariano came to my office when they gave me his, his glove. Like, there's nothing like it. And Absolutely. I'm like, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to set up a new platform that's going to do that for every player. I'm like, I, I mean, that's just not, imagine if I can go get hundreds of players that you can get on our website. And right. You're all time idol and dream player, the guy or the woman that you love watching play. You can then buy something from them directly that they wore or something that they autographed and, or they could autograph something that from a game you went to. I said, and then I just, I just started playing this thing out. And before you know, like, we're three, four years later, we're launching it next in now two weeks. And we'll see. I mean, it's just that's a start from a dream. I mean, just that you're dreaming it out. Like, and the dream started with uh, I was up in heaven. I was going up to heaven, actually. And, and wait, so this God is the was, actual dream you're having? Yeah. And God was like, you know, so Brandon, how do you think you did? I mean, it, it, tell me about this business thing because I'd never really seen anything with this whole autograph thing. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I think I did pretty good. I mean, I think this this is great. He goes, well, if you were so good, like, why didn't every athlete sign up with you? <laughs> if you were that good, like, what was there a line outside your office? Because I didn't see that. I, you definitely grinded out and got a lot of big names. I see you got Jeter and Mariano, and you know, I'm a Yankee fan. God, sure. Yankee fan, by the way. So he's like, <laughs> I, I see you got a lot of these big name players, but you didn't get them all. Like, what was stopping you? And I was like, whoa. And then I started like, getting into the whole thing. Like, you know, why? Because players, they want to control. They want to do it themselves. They'd rather have more input. I was coming up with all these reasons why my company wasn't even blowing up even more. And then wow. I was acting on what the solution to that would be. And that's just crazy dreaming. I mean, just like, I mean, who dreams that having this conversation with God and he's critiquing your business? So you got schooled by God. Like, hey, you know, Brandy, you could have done better. You know, not everybody signed up. Wow. So, so, so that, that, that was the, the beginning of that. That is a fantastic dream. Yeah. Yeah, wow. No, no, no wonder daydreaming is so important to you. Um, it, listen, this has been a, a great conversation. Um, one we'll of the do it again, man. Anytime. What, I've always, I always got something to talk about. I, 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 I love it. I, I like to ask, finish with one last one. One last sure. one. You've obviously created a whole bunch of success. I don't have to remind you of that, of course. And maybe you've spoken about it in, the, in, in your books in one way, shape, or form. But as you look back over the career and the businesses you've built, if you had a do-over, a mulligan, what would it be? 
Oh, boy. I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but I think on a personal level, I probably would have had more kids. Um, I would have been home for dinner a little bit earlier on a lot more nights when my kids were younger. That's why mm. one of my few big regrets that I came up with this bullshit, you know, how busy I am and why I couldn't make it home on time for dinner. Right, I didn't right. really eat things, but, you know, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I could have been so much more efficient. I, I, I tell younger people, like, there's a lot of things you got to learn, but time management is something you can't afford to take much time figuring out how to do it. Don't waste a lot of time figuring out the time management scheme because right. that is the one asset that is a variable not in your favor. Exactly. So wow. I, I think I, I think when I look at the overall business, um, you know, I, I I wish that I could have like back in you know when 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 I had the success, but particularly in the early two thousands, I wish that didn't get to my head. I wish I really, really recognized that that was partly luck and probably a, a, a result of a lot, a lot of hard work and not to ride on that success, but to try to get the same kind of success by doing the things that got me there and continue the processes. And I think that success, can, like I mentioned earlier in the conversation, could be a tremendous deterrent mm -hmm. and it also mm -hmm. can really steer you the wrong way. I mean, you got to remember your success is, is not – now, the success you have in business is not necessarily who you are. It's the circumstances that you put yourself in. So whether you're rich or poor, you're still a good person. And you, you as a person shouldn't change. I, I think when I had that financial success for a few years, I think I let that get to my head. And I think it steered me in the wrong direction. Um, and I, I now know that there's my business success. But right. that doesn't affect the kind of person I am and who I am and what's important to me. I'm not, no, no way I'm going to let that ever happen between my relationship with my family, friends, and even how I act in the business, regardless of whether I had a, made a million dollars today or whether I lost a million dollars today, I'm gonna try to stay you know, the same kind of person and, and not let that stuff get to my head. That, that, was, that, that was powerful, thank you for sharing. That really was, thank you, oh, I appreciate it. Well, well listen. Thank you and you know, stay safe, man, and you know, most importantly, Increase your level of non-acceptance, man, because it doesn't really matter where you are right now, whether you're left out because your business got blown up or whether you've had a decent run the last year. All that stuff doesn't really matter. What yep. matters now is what you're willing to accept and how you want this game to go forward. Your, your, your future is not fixed. So there's so many things about to happen in these next 6 to 12 months that we've never seen, and a mm -hmm. lot of it good. And it's just a matter of how you can get your head and square up your past. So... Um, you know, get into a high level of non-acceptance. I mean, you may have had a bad, you may have been dealt a bad hand because of this virus sure. that may have put you sure. in a really tough spot. But don't let that be, you know, don't let that dictate. Don't let the past dictate your future. You know, whatever you're doing, there's something bigger and better ahead. It's just a matter of getting your mindset right and getting yourself ready for change. Awesome. Well, Brandon Steiner, it's uh, it's a pleasure. It's I was looking forward to this interview for a while. Um, I'm a big fan. Thanks so much for sharing some time today. Appreciate you. Thanks. Be well. You got it. And this is the Profit Express. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at the Profit Express on Twitter as well at Profit underscore Express for latest updates and newest episodes just like the one we just had with Brandon Steiner at the Steiner Agency. Thanks so much.